All right. Uh, well, welcome to the Fortify Your Data podcast. This is, I think, technically like episode 70, but of the episodes that weren't filmed at a conference, this is the 42nd. This is the second time Mike McGill has been on. Uh, and this is now uh, exactly when this gets released will be exactly two years from the first podcast that was released, which was also featuring Mike McGill. <laughs> so uh, so it's I'm very happy that we we're able to make this timeline work because I did not give you a lot of warning and I recognize that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. again, uh, thank you for, for joining. Um, how has life changed for you in the last two years, Mr. McGill? Well, first of all, Michael, thank you for having me back on. It's an honor to be a, a, a repeat guest uh, and to get the chance to, to talk with you for a little bit. Um, you know, gosh, you know, how has life changed in the last two years? I mean, other than a, a, a pandemic uh, and a public health emergency that we've had over the last couple of years, I suppose it's, uh, you know, status quo. Um, yeah, you know, the pandemic, I'm now coming up on a year of working from home which I can remember a year ago, you know, like, okay, we're going to get everybody home. We're going to make sure that all of our employees are, are safe and our patients are safe and everyone's safe and we're going to get everyone home. I can remember the, the sense of, of, of uh, uncertainty and the unknown that I was going into, having been somebody who's never worked from home for any extended period of time. Um, but, you know, we've made it work and, you know, I've made it work and there's some benefits to it. So, uh, it's just kind of major lifestyle changes, I would say, is, is the is the biggest change from when we talked a couple of years ago. For sure, I'm sure, and I know that your uh, your wife worked from home primarily prior to COVID, right? Yeah, my wife's worked from home since my son well, since my son was born, so he's over 14 now. So she's been working. Yeah, this is her normal, and so yeah, we're coming onto her turf. So you know, <laughs> she's you know she's here in her fortress of solitude during the day at home, and usually I'm off at work, kids are off at school, and here we go, March of 2020, and we all come busting in the door, and here we are. We're gonna we're gonna be on your on your turf now for a while. But yeah, yeah, my wife is uh, she's been doing the work from home thing for a while. You know, or telecommute as we used to call it you know she telecommuted you know over a year ago we called it telecommuting she telecommuted now it's you know work from home so she's worked from home i'm work from home have been for a while but yeah she's this has been her normal it was my new normal but uh you know now it's just my normal normal and i'm sure she's thrilled with that <laughs> <laughs> I, would, we're co I would i would i'd grade this out okay we're cohabitating okay we, we yeah. we're doing all right we're doing all right I believe it. I believe it. Um, as far as uh, like changes to the business, right? I mean, uh, obviously, everyone working from home, you're gonna you're gonna be facing a lot of uh, I think familiar issues with anyone in any industry, but supporting, you know, the health industry, right? Delivering oxygen tanks and whatnot. How is how has COVID affected any of that, right? I mean, you guys have I see delivery trucks pass my house every day with medical services company. So there's somebody yeah. around here that desperately needs you. <laughs> how has how has COVID affected how, uh, you know like I, how supply chain hits you, how you service your customers, things of that nature? Yeah, a couple of good points. A couple of very different things. Supply chain, where you know we face supply chain issues like everyone else, we've definitely run into um, inventory and supply chain and, and delivery issues of just getting the medical equipment that we provide to our patients into our warehouse. So, you know, there's, but, you know, our team's done an excellent job. We've navigated it. We've been able to take care of all of our patients. So it's never put us in any, that has never put us in a crisis mode. Um, caring for our patients has is, is got very different. You know, pre-COVID, it was you came into our office or, or one of our respiratory therapists or medical equipment technicians went to your home and we had a nice face-to-face -face interaction. Um, you know, so I would say our biggest business shift was going to a telemedicine model. Um, so there's really two, there's different types of equipment. There's equipment that we provide that we need to be in your home. Like if we're, we can't, you know, we can't ship you oxygen tanks or, or a, 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 an oxygen concentrator. Um, we've tried to go to a, a touchless model with that, where we deliver it at your doorstep and then provide training in a more of a touchless environment than what we used to be before. But I think the more interesting shift has been for our CPAP census. So people with sleep apnea who need a CPAP machine um, a little less acute, so we can ship the CPAP to your home, and then we get on a Zoom for healthcare. Uh, you know, oh, session. interesting. 
and, and so we, we're, we're telemedicine now for most, for the biggest part of our business, we're telemedicine. So that was the biggest shift for us from a caring for our patient standpoint, we're shifting to a, a telemedicine model, which in the end, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's very analogous to work from home. You know, people used to go into the office and congregate there for eight hours and then drive however long period of time back home. And um, now they've gotten to work from home and, and they like it. They're just as productive. They don't have the commute. There's more quality time with family. There's not dead time of driving back and forth to work. And I would say the same thing with our patients. You know, they prefer to not have to drive into our office to have get set up on a CPAP machine that they can do it from the comfort of their own home. So it's 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 still proving to be uh, an ex an excellent model for giving the quality of care that we want to give to our patients. But that is the biggest shift for us since COVID as a com as a business was going to a telemedicine model. Do you anticipate going back to a non telemedicine model or some sort? Of, I assume it's going to be a hybrid approach no matter what. But do you, I, I guess the how do I want to frame this question better? Do you think that there is a, if, if you do go back, do you think it's because the customers wanted it or because it's better for business? I, you know, it, it's, I don't want to sound like a cop up. I think it's a little bit of both. Again, kind of, you know, what I just, I think our, our patients like not having to drive into, you know, we're, you know, we have an office in Oakwood Village. We have an office in Cincinnati. We have an office in Dayton, Detroit. We have fixed offices that you're going to have to drive some period of time to get to and commit some period of your life. Um, you know, you can shave an hour off of that whole experience by just being in your home and cracking up your tablet or your laptop and having a Zoom session. So we envision that telemedicine will be around to one degree or, or, or another and that there's mutual benefit to both the patient and to us that, of the efficiency of having that experience. But, you know, as, as things, you know, loosen back up and restrictions are removed and people start getting back out there in the world, we'll, we'll accommodate that um, as safely as we can to ensure the, the safety of our employees and the safety of our patients as well. But I'm sure there will be some degree of going back to face-to-face -to -face, uh, encounters, but there will always be a degree of, of telemedicine. And, and we anticipate that probably most of our uh, interactions for CPAP patients will continue to be telemedicine. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the thing that I'm kind of trying to, to get at too, and I'm sure that you've seen it also on LinkedIn, there is now a collective groan of people going, I don't want to go back to the office. Right. I'm, I like this. This is this. I didn't want to leave the office, but now I can't imagine going back. Yeah. And so I, I'm, I'm interested in what that looks like. Cause I think that, yeah, I think that you get more family time. I think a lot of people are working more from home just because yeah. they're always on now. Right. And I think that like the really, like the practicality of the office isn't a modern thing, right? You, you need some face to face and I do crave that. I do wish that we were back in a podcast studio. Obviously that's one of the things I lost over COVID, but um, this is just as good and I've been able to do uh, more podcasts for other people. I've been able to just, I've been able to do a lot more, honestly, like in every way, shape and form because of COVID. And I'm not saying that COVID's good, but yeah. from that standpoint, you know, I happen to know a little bit about your business from a technical perspective too. How do you put the toothpaste back in the tube when you give everyone this, like, like their own home setup, right? Like right. where they just take their home setup into a desk and then they st they're, they're stuck at work. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a few different levels to that. Um, so for one, very proud of what we've done. And really, we, we're, we're trying to create an optimal work experience for our team members. And we've, we've done surveys and we've polled and, and we're hearing loud and clear that there is a percentage of, a, a large percentage of people who want to continue to work from home. So we, from an, an employee retention and attraction and quality of life standpoint, we're going to accommodate that. Um, we have some employees that are essential employees that need to come into work. And, and then we also, the, the, so both of those two extremes are easy. If you want to work from home, we've got that figured out. We have it set up. We have a model. We're going to ship you a laptop, a couple monitors. Um, you know, you are going, you know, you're going to have a, a microphone, camera, you have everything to have a Teams and Zoom type experience to keep the culture and keep the face-to-face -face going on. You want to come in back into the office full time when we're ready to accommodate that. Um, yeah, cool. I know how to do that. We've been doing that for years, you know. 
it's the people in between that are going to create the the interesting challenges of the of the toothpaste back into the tube. Like, how do you accommodate somebody who wants to work at home a couple of days and wants to come into the office a few days a week? So, from a pure technical standpoint, you know, we're, you know, when you're at home, you have a laptop in front of you, you got a couple of monitors, you got a docking station behind you. Take your laptop, plug in the docking station, boom. So, what we'll we'll do in the office is most likely have hotel type space with docking stations and a couple monitors in it. You just bring, you unplug at home, bring your laptop in, plugging in the docking station at work, and boom, you're back into your dual monitor environment. Um, I think the nuance that we're still working through is how much of that space do we need to make? Do we need to create a reservation system? Um, you know, where you reserve the space. Oh, I'm gonna grab cubicle 33. Okay. In, in the in Cleveland office and reserve that space. So yeah, I think again, that will, I think we'll need to figure out the intricacies based on how many people want to do that. Do we need to invest or will we always just have enough? We have, you know, 30 hotel spaces in our one office for the 15 people that want to go back and forth versus who wants to stay at home all the time. So, I, you know, I think that's the technical aspect of just making sure. Do we need a reservation system? How do we make sure that it's easy for you without unplugging every single piece of technology and, and throwing it in your car? And then taking 45 minutes to set it back up when you get into the office that you can just unplug, plug in at the office, very plug and play to move back and forth and just create as mobile an environment as possible. So again, that's the technology from the culture standpoint. You know, my job as CIO is just to make sure that we can accommodate that strategic vision of the company that we want to, um, we want to provide the best experience for employees, whether it's in office, at home, or if they want to go in between. Yeah, I think that that's a very measured approach. I have uh, very recently on this podcast even interviewed people uh, that are in situations where they're going to force their entire work staff to work in the office, and there there's a huge hesitation towards it, where they're like, "Listen, we get that we have this tremendous real estate, uh, you know, investment, but you're going to risk that talent investment." At least I was playing devil's advocate and saying, "Hey." If you told me that I had to be at the office 40 hours a week again, and I, you know, I just, I just experienced a year of this freedom, I think it'd be very difficult to keep me. Um, so I think that, I, again, I, I think the model that I advertise to him, I'm like, Tuesday, Thursday, you're in the office, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're not. Um, Wednesday, no one's allowed to set up a, even a Zoom meeting, because no one likes Wednesdays. That way you have two productive days, a day to answer email, and two productive days. I think that's the model that Michael Hudak would bestow, but I'm not in a position to bestow that upon anyone. I'm just the, uh, what is it, the, the, the high priest leader, just shouting with my staff saying, you know, no work on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> right, right. I mean, look, man, there's a spectrum. You know, I mean, it, you know, it, it, I think it depends a lot on the culture of the company. I mean, there was concern. We, we made these decisions very thoughtfully. I mean, you know, obviously, in April and May and June of 2020, nobody knew what was going on and how long this was going to last. I mean, we're operating very much in the short term, 30 day increments of what are we going to do the next 30 days? And then it started stretching out. What are we going to do the next quarter? Um, it's been a very thoughtful process. And you know, the senior leadership is concerned about culture. I mean, we are a family business, family owned business. We take pride in the sense of, of family that we have. Um, and there's fear that you lose that in a remote environment. So um, there was you know, decisions and, and there was very thoughtful discussions being had of, of that versus the, again, the attraction retention, the benefits that our team members feel. So I think we were able to find a happy medium with technology that you, know, you can via Teams, via Zoom, you can still have face-to-face -face interactions. And there's just so many, so many pros to allowing our team members to work the way they want to work. And, you know, we can recruit somebody in Las Vegas now. We can, we can find the best talent no matter where they may live because we have broken out of that mindset of you need to come into an office in order to be a member of the team. So it's just, there's so many pros. It's get quality of life for our employees. It just expands the talent pool to the, you know, it, it just is so many benefits that we decided to go in that direction, but use technology to still keep that sense of family and team that we have. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that you guys have probably one of the more forward or just like, I guess, empathetic uh, company stances on it, uh, at least that we've interviewed on Fortify Your Data so far. 
Um, I did now, I, I did one question before we move away from it. How many telecommunication employees did you have prior to COVID out of curiosity? Well, I, I could say in terms of percentages, 10% of our team telecommute. Yeah. So prior to COVID, it was almost a, you kind of earned your way into. We had some, some people that we recruited that came on board as telecommuters. Okay. Um, but the biggest, the larger percentage were, were people who've been around for a while and, and they were high performers and their life circumstances turned out in such a way like my wife when, when our son was born. Right. She wanted to become a telecommuter. She was a high performer. She's awesome, incredible what she does. So, so she was allowed to work from home. Um, you know, now again, it, it's shifting more to the model of, you know, you just kind of come on board as, as, a, as a work from home employee. So again, it was about 10% um, prior and we're like 80% work yeah. from home. Well, that, that makes sense too. Cause I was like, you, you guys already at least kind of knew what that was going to look like. You know, I think that's also a fair distinction because there's a lot of these companies that are like, we had no one work from home. Okay. Uh, we, we hired two people in Denver. We set up an office in Denver for them. So I think that that's uh, something that they're rethinking now. Uh, but I did not bring you on just to talk about that. Uh, recently, uh, you know, at least from the casual observer, your Twitter following has skyrocketed. Uh, and that isn't necessarily because of your awesome handling from a technical standpoint of COVID, right? I think largely that's this IT thought leadership and philosophical stoic persona that, I don't know if persona is fair, it's you, right? But it's this, um, the, the thoughtful uh, quotes, the, the um, stoic approach that you take to it, the ideas of taking somebody that is a technician and making them a tech leader or tech professional to tech leader. Sorry, I was uh, stalling because I couldn't remember that. Um, I, I find this very uh, engaging. This is probably some of the best content I've seen out of one of our peers in our Cleveland tech scene, right? And it's because it does, it does take that, that leap outside of Let's talk about VPNs and MPLS networks. That's probably a dated term, but you know what I mean. This, it, you you kind of you kind of separated from it. So, and we talked on stoicism our first podcast, and we've talked about stoicism offline for years. What made you really come into that? What made you? I, I, I at least from what I've seen, I'm going to say you doubled down on it. What what kind of shifted your focus, and uh, what's come of it? Yeah, no, I, you know, first I'll say. Skyrocketed is a very generous term, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, somehow during COVID, I discovered Twitter. Um, I mean, I've been on Twitter for ten years, but it was like the far distant social media platform that I ever spent any time on. I'm on LinkedIn as a professional. I'm on Facebook with my friends and family and all that kind of stuff. And Twitter was like once in a blue moon, I would go, "Oh yeah, Twitter." Let me go pop on there. Um, somehow during COVID, I, I honestly can't put my finger on it. I, I somehow found my way back into Twitter and kind of found this really cool environment. I mean, I think Twitter can get a bad name in that, you know, trust me, there are toxic, toxic corners of Twitter that are very political. And, and, you know, I mean, if you, you know, you follow the right people and, and you put out the right content, you can find a very positive environment of people, uh, which I've been lucky enough to find. But, you know, as far as, creating and writing. So I've had a blog for a few years and it's been very niched down to Mike McGill, the IT professional. Um, I'm not a, I'm not technical enough to, to write technical content. I've always felt that the most value I might be able to give the tech community is helping IT professionals develop into IT leaders. And I've walked the path. I started my career as a contractor. I'm a CIO now. There's a lot that I learned along the way. And I just felt the interest of sharing that. So I was very niched down into that. When I got onto Twitter, it's a little bit more kind of like you expand yourself a little bit more. And I mean, like, I'm not going to, I don't know that I can sit and tweet all day long about um, IT professional development. I mean, I think you're, you're, what you are interested in, what you love kind of comes out a little bit more in that environment. And I love stoicism. Uh, you know, again, like you said, we talked about stoicism for a while. I'm going to say maybe about five years ago, let's ballpark it uh, via the book, The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. Uh, I found my, I found stoicism, you know, randomly just by reading that book. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a reader. 
and somehow I found that book and learned about stoicism. So it's, it's something I'm passionate about, something I love. I'm, I'm reading um, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor by Donald Roberts, Robertson right now. I'm like always, I'm always nerding out. I'm always reading a stoicism book. So on Twitter, I'm like, oh yeah, stoicism's cool. I'm gonna tweet about stoicism too. Um, yeah, I guess the question is if back to an audience standpoint, you know, what's the, am I, am I trying to build an audience? How can I bring value to other people? And you kind of mash up these things and hopefully it becomes something that's not too random, but you know, so yeah, so I, you know, I tweet a lot about stoicism because it's something I'm passionate about. And I also believe that it's something that IT, people in the IT field can benefit from very much. Uh, it, it's stressful being in IT, you know, servers crash, you know, we're, we're under attack, there's bugs in the code, um, there's, there's a lot of, uh, ad, you know, adversity that we face in the IT profession. Um, so a stoic approach is very beneficial uh, to be able to be objective, to be accepting, um, to understand what you can control and what you can't control. So uh, long answer maybe to a short question, but um, yeah, so I tweet a lot about stoicism just because it's something I'm passionate about. And I, I think it's something that also fits into helping IT professionals reach their potential. I think stoicism is, is a very powerful layer to add to your skill stack as an IT professional. Yeah, don't worry. That was a long-winded question on my part. So <laughs> it's not, uh, we're both, uh, we're both long-winded in that. So I, I like, I like that that niche that you've created, right? Because it's it's stoic IT, however you want to say that, right? That's probably not the sexiest way to market it, but there are there are you 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 do have a following, I guess is my point. Uh, there are some tweets that I've seen that have just legitimately, maybe disproportionately to your other ones, but I look and I'm like, oh wow, that one got really pushed, right? And we're both into you know. Um, Naval's Twitter, uh, for mm -hmm. example, and I know that that's a heavy, heavy inspiration, and that's another thing that kind of brings us together there. But I noticed, and the thing that kind of pulled me back into Twitter, right, was was you, candidly, because uh, now I'm on Twitter more often than I've been, and What's and really, <laughs> right, go down but it's random. because it was because you actually let that bleed into your LinkedIn content. You know, not every atomic essay that you write or every essay you write turns into an article on LinkedIn, but some of them were, right? Yeah. Uh, and even from what I could, what I can glean, there are people on LinkedIn that were like, wow, this is different. You know, they're paying attention to it. You're getting engagement there. Um, I know we talked earlier about not having necessarily an end game with it, but what's an ideal scenario with you? How, how would you, uh, obviously we're not saying quit your day job, but like what, what, if you could do anything with this niche that you've, mm -hmm. that you're culminating, right? Let's say it, let's say it triples in size over the year and you have people that are just waiting to see what Mike McGill tweets next, right? Um, would you, do you want to lead people into some sort of, uh, you know, stoic cohort? Do you want people to, do you, do you want to focus on IT leaders? I guess, where would you take it, right? Yeah, no, that, that's a good question. And uh, there's a few different ideas bouncing around in the hopper of where this may go. Um, see, most importantly is how can I give value back? Who, who would value most from what I have to say? And I still feel as though being a coach mentor for IT professionals to help them in their own leadership progression is something that definitely hits home. So I feel kind of that's the unique value maybe that I could bring to, that would really help people. Um, the passion for stoicism, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of building something there and potentially a book, uh, potentially a cohort based group of people who also love stoicism and want to support and learn more and become um, kind of adopt stoic practices in their lives a little bit more and learn more about it. That's of interest to me as well. Um, you know, I just launched a newsletter called the Mindset Blueprint, which is uh, almost kind of layered on top of both of those, just kind of uh, different ways to view uh, kind of how to change your mindset. I kind of believe, you know, you know, your your mindset paints the world for you. I kind of think kind of a 
life is what it is, you know, it's our mindset that kind of paints the colors. So again, there's a lot that I've learned and studied with stoicism and mindfulness and different approaches that I kind of put out through that. So I, I look, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up and all of this. For now, it is, it's a hobby. It's something I'm doing. I think the value that I might be able to bring is through, you know, helping IT professionals and maybe again, doubling down on mentoring and coaching there. But, you know, there's some stoicism stuff bouncing around in the hopper too, that I have a couple of loose ideas forming in my head of what I might to do, might be able to do with that. Again, in the sense of bringing value in that, I, I believe that everybody could benefit in some way, shape or form. You know, you don't need to nerd out on stoicism like I do, um, but there's some very basic stoic practices and principles that can help anybody live a better life. So there's some interest there and kind of going down that pathway a little bit too, and, and maybe doing something more with stoicism. What are, what's, I guess, what are the current hurdles that are stopping you from, from doing that today? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I got a pretty awesome job. Um, that You can do um, both. That's, oh, no, I look, no, I mean, and trust me, I, you know, I mean, I want to, you know, it, time can be the biggest excuse you can make out there. Look, I could throw out an excuse and say, I don't have enough time. Right. If, if it's important enough to me, I'll find the time. I mean, I always find the time to brush my teeth. I find the time to take a shower every day. I find the time to eat. I mean, there's always time to do stuff that's important to you. So it's, it, you know, it's, if you say you can't find the time to do, to do it, it's just probably not that important. So the realistic side of it is that I, I have an incredible job that deserves the best of me. Uh, I got to make sure that I'm given the best there. I have an incredible family that needs needs me around. Um, I can't be huddled up here in my office all day long writing and, and building things and all that. So um, I try to carve out time. So this is to me, this is the greatest thing of work from home for me is what used to be my commute time, which I enjoyed my commute time because I would do podcasts. I would do audio books. Like I, I, I tried to not make that dead time. You know, mm -hmm. I would always try to use that as time to continue to learn and grow. And I mean, got hooked on the Tim Ferriss podcast and a lot of stuff. I would just listen to, to podcasts and, you know, it was a, a gateway drug to like all these other, I mean, to Naval, to Jocko Willing, to Seth Godin, to like all these other great thinkers through the Tim Ferriss podcast. So it was valuable time, but that has now shifted into my, my writing time, kind of more creative time. So my day typically starts off you know, after I take dogs out and help get kids ready for school and do the stuff that I have to do as a father and husband, and I come into my office, you know, that first 45 to 60 minutes of my day is more kind of creative time of, of, of writing, of, of trying to build things out. So again, long rambling answer to uh, an easy question. It's, it's a work in progress. Um, maybe the itch isn't great enough right now that I'm ready to like drop other stuff and focus on building these things out. It's happening slowly. Well, and I'm always, I always forget that people have like kids and dogs and <laughs> I, I, it's just so alien to me, but um, for sure I was picking on you a little bit there and I recognize that, That's but right. I think no that worries. you need a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, look, man, we all, we all, we all need a push. And that's what mentors, friends, communities, Mm -hmm. Before, I know we're both a member, members of a, of a writing community right now, yep. which creates that accountability and creates those constraints because, you know, there's beauty in constraints. Like we need, we need the constraints. I mean, if it's just the wild, wild west of just doing whatever the heck we feel like when we wake up in the morning, you know, probably nothing's going to get done. So, you know, you need those constraints and sometimes community and the nudges and the encouragement from members of that community are just what the doctor ordered to keep you on track and, and doing 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 what you want to do and doing creative work or doing whatever it is that community you're a part of is all trying to do together. Absolutely, and that, that community, if anyone's wondering, because we're, we're being uh, kind of vague about it, is Ship 30 for 30 by a guy named Dickie Bush. You can find him on Twitter. Um, the constraints we're speaking to, uh, just for clarity, these are daily atomic essays for 30 days. That's where the 30 for 30 comes in. So it's 30, 200, it's 250 word yeah, words, 250 right? 250 word ballpark. I've been, I've been slamming pictures in there and bringing that down way down to 200. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> it's, those are the constraints. And there, there, are, there are some benefits I caught on immediately. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm a pretty cynical person in general. So I kind of walked in with low expectations and uh, 
I found that the first essay I wanted to write was about a thousand words. And then I was able to bring that down to 200, 250 words by just cutting out all of the, the jargon. Like, so like, if you, if you, re, if you read Fortify Your Data, you'll notice that I like to start things with, with that having been said, comma, instead of saying however, because that's how I speak. But that's not really the best way to just transfer data and information, right? And I think that just immediately off of the first couple essays, I was able to really reevaluate how I talk. Um, and that's been huge. I don't know if I don't know if you want to speak to any of the benefits that you've seen since you've been in cohorts a little bit longer than I have. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so you know, how I kind of found that community again, randomly on Twitter. You know, you mentioned Dickie Bush. Like I had started following him on Twitter, then he put this tweet about, "Hey, would anybody interested be interested in doing this?" And uh, I raised my hand because I'm a painfully slow writer. Without, I had no constraints other than the ones in my own head. Like, okay, I tell myself I want to write again. I've had a blog, and it, it's. I, I write, but I, I mean, I'll put out like a blog post a quarter. Like I, I like painfully slow at writing just because the only constraints are the ones that I come up with in my head and I just haven't been able to be disciplined enough on it. So I'm like, this is just what I need. Um, you know, so I joined it and I'm in my fourth cohort now. It's again, for me, it's what the doctor ordered to give me again, those, the, those, those, you know, those guardrails, those constraints of writing every day, of having accountability, um, and to your point about 250 words, sometimes it's harder to write less than to write more. And exactly what you said, it, it does kind of help clean up your thinking a little bit like, okay, how do I not use the word really or very or all these kind of other things that I tend to fluff up my words with or my writing with. So it's been a good exercise for me to kind of become more of a maybe crisp writer. I, I mean, again, I, I'm playing the long game. I'm a work in progress when it comes to writing. Um, Writing, having a discipline to write daily is just part of it. Like, I mean, I need to write engaging content that people feel like reading. So it's finding that happy medium between just bullet lists, um, which are great if I'm trying to communicate a simple point to you. Okay, boom, bullet, 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 bullet. All right, there you go. You got the picture. But if you're trying to read and some, you know, engage with the content, it does need to maybe be fleshed out a little bit. So it's just, it, it's, it's been good and helped me create a daily discipline of writing. You know, I'm sitting on a content library. It can be a future blog post and there's going to be newsletters and there's going to be eBooks and all this good stuff. So it's helped me build up a content library. Uh, good community. A lot of, I met a lot of really interesting uh, people as part of that, but uh, yeah, it's been a, a fun experience. But again, just for me, it all started with just wanting to develop a writing habit. Yeah, and as somebody that I, because I, I, I don't, I didn't have this regimented of a writing habit by any means, and and I do anticipate a point in my the future where I'm not writing every day, um, but uh, I do find it, uh, the 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 value of constraints is something that I definitely underestimated, and I immediately was proven wrong, and I and I always appreciate when I'm just like ah oh, huh, wrong again, huh? Uh, I cherish <laughs> I cherish that feeling. Yeah, it's it is again kind of what's cool about Twitter. I think of all this, of the social media platforms, again, if you're following the right people, you feel a little bit like you're plugged into the neural link and you just start thinking in terms of leverage and constraints and, and maybe terminology or concepts that you really didn't think of before. Like, I got to admit, like a year ago, I wasn't thinking, oh, constraints. I need to put constraints in my life. I mean, I may right. have been thinking of that in terms of like, yeah, I have to-do lists and I have schedules and you know, there are just naturally constraints in my life, but I wouldn't have verbalized it as constraints and seen it in that perspective of, you know, the easy thing to do is to complain about the rules and the, the regulations and the regimen, but it's a, it's a different nuanced view to look at and say, oh, there's beauty in these constraints because without the constraints, it's chaos, you know, it's and that the more constraints that you can put into place, the better you can create, whether that's a project I'm shipping for a medical service company. Um, we have a predictive dialer we want to implement. I, I need constraints to make sure I'm disciplined enough to see this project through, or whether it's writing 250 words a day. Um, there's there's beauty in these constraints. So it's just, again, it's, it's the Naval Ravikant stuff, and it's just this kind of plugging into Twitter, where again, if you follow the right people, you just kind of come upon some really interesting concepts and different views of things. Absolutely. And, and again, it's like one of those things where um, 
because I know a lot of my friends that listen to this podcast and uh, heckle me on emails. Uh, it's definitely something that is worth looking into before you heckle me on it. Uh, and I know that you've already been somewhat annoyed by these atomic essays that popped up on a Twitter account that used to never post at all, ever. So I recognize that it's been good for me, might be good for you. Um, you know who you are. It's not one person, it's several. <laughs> so I guess, because uh, I, I, I do see we're kind of coming up on a time. There's one other thing that I definitely wanted to get in here, um, just because uh, I think we have a mutual admiration for each other over the years, even though we're in very uh, different parts of like, um, we're on different stages of our lives really, but we're, we're definitely, we, we definitely have taken very different paths, right? Uh, you have the constraints of a dog and family. I have constraints of a greenhouse and a cat I found outside. Slightly different choices. Uh, as, as somebody that's like a little more than a decade my senior, what advice do you have for me generally? Oh, wow. That is a really, really good question. I guess I would almost say, so like, I don't know, how, how different in age are we? Like, what, like what would I- what, what Like I 13 years. To, yeah, what yeah. would have I said to my- To yourself 13 years ago, yeah. What would That'd I have be said it. to myself 13 years ago? What? Would I have said to myself back when I was single and I just had a greenhouse and a cat to worry about? Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of the stuff that we talked about. You know, I mean, I, I will say this, man. I think we learn what we need to learn when we need to learn it. And and the best advice and wisdom we get is life kicking our butts a little bit. Like I could go back to my 13 year old self and say, "Hey, dude, you should write every day because like writing is really cool. It's gonna make you think about different things." Um, it's going to open up opportunities. Uh, you know, it's just going to be this great thing. I don't know that my self of 13 years ago, I would have said, well, yeah, but my kids are like one and soon to be born two years from now or something 13 years ago. Um, you know, I would have had all these other things going on in my life that I, I would have been able to do it or I would have found reason not to do it. So, uh, again, sometimes I feel that it, we have to find our path a little bit and, and giving advice. Uh, you know, we have to kind of learn our own advice. But all that being said, um, I would go back to myself 13 years ago and say, all right, dude, there's this book called Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Because at that point, um, The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday would not have been written yet. I'd say, <laughs> like, you should read this book. You know, I'll drop a book off for you. Go ahead, read this book yeah. and just think about stoicism a little bit. And because there, look, I will say this, man, it's just, again, practical stoicism i mean the me today is a happier individual than the me of 13 years ago and stoicism is a big part of that so whatever i would i would give myself a stoicism book and i would tell myself to meditate for 10 minutes a day and i would have talked to myself a little bit about compounding interest and and the compounding interest of these daily habits and and one of them that's super powerful is mindfulness meditation um, I'll riff on that brief again. I know we're coming up against time, but honestly, I'll, I'll go down to that. I would have told myself to start meditating because I will say even, even above and beyond stoicism, or at least on equal ground with that, um, developing a mindfulness meditation habit has been one of the most powerful things I've ever had. And it's going to be hard to explain other than it puts a dis distance, a gap between stimulus and response. And you know, I'm not gonna act like I'm not still a jerk sometimes. And, and that response comes very quickly after the stimulus. But from having meditated way more often than not, things that used to trigger me, I now have an objectivity gap. Um, and I can kind of choose not to have that response that maybe I had at one point in my life. Mindfulness is, I think, a huge, I would, I would recommend anybody start a mindfulness. And it's it's such a low barrier to entry. I'm not saying go do transcendental meditation and find an hour to sit down and meditate. It, it, it's, it's tough to carve out that kind of time. I've been meditating for probably about three or four years now. And it, it it's, it's a 10 minute daily meditation. And I miss some days too. But the compounding value of, of mindfulness, I think is huge. It's been huge in my life. So there you go long roundabout answer <laughs> i would tell myself from 13 years ago to start meditate start meditating for 10 minutes a day 
Well, I was blessed uh, that two years ago, somebody did hand me, um, so, uh, handed me all, you handed me the obstacle is the way, but then I immediately got Marcus Aurelius. And then, you know, the obstacle is the way is a great book because it was small enough that it was always in my backpack. And I used to be a business guy that had a backpack and not a, whatever a business people are supposed to have. And every time I was on a plane, I'd be trapped there with my backpack because all my other stuff was in overhead lug luggage. And for the last two years, it's been the only book I've read on a plane over and over. <laughs> and every time I read it, I read it from a different perspective, it seems. And I do appreciate that. It's definitely um, just double checking myself here. Yeah, it is the best book anyone's ever given me. Um, wow. wow. So. Well, thank you, Mike. That means a lot. I, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that it that you've enjoyed it. And uh makes me happy to know that. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a banged up looking book because it's been to different countries and different states and on many different planes. But yeah, I mean, just, just in terms of, not just in content, but in terms of just like, it's just, it's been the book that for whatever reason, I still carry with me wherever I go. Mm -hmm. um, somewhat intentional, somewhat unintentional. Now it's probably more intentional because I refuse to take it out of the backpack, but um, it has had, it definitely has had a, a huge impact on my life. Um, one thing that I wanted to kind of question on that, though, is how do you define happiness? Because you mentioned that twice in your stoicism made you happier in general. And I worry that sometimes I don't even think about being happy enough. Yeah. It's just something I don't really measure. Yeah, God, I could go down in the ball path a little bit there and, and you know, say, uh, you know, happiness is peace and motion or something like that. I, you know, I, I think it's it's where can you kind of find moments of peace again i think in that space and again i'll go back to mindfulness so i look i'll say stoicism helps with happiness like i think people have the wrong impression of stoicism just the word stoic like i'm going to be very stone-faced and stoic where to me stoicism is more it's kind of farming out the negative emotion you know not getting upset over things i can't control being more objective it's going to create more space for joy and happiness to reside in because i'm not just sitting there worried about the pandemic or worried about politics or worried about what my boss is my boss going to fire me tomorrow. I mean, things I don't have, these things you worry about that in the end, I, I can't control in this moment. So stoicism helps kind of, as you learn, as you start kind of offloading those emotions, there's space. So when I'm like, my wife and I go for a walk, I'm not sitting there thinking about this thing or that thing that I used to worry about or used to, you know, kind of, you know, kind of start the, the knots in your stomach a little bit, thinking about these things. It's more, uh, I, you know, it might come in and I go, well, I can't control that anyhow. So bounces back out. Now I have more space to be present and to be in the moment. And that's where all the happiness is. It's like right here, all this kind of cool stuff we're surrounded by right now. Um, my family, I can be more present with my family. I can appreciate moments with my kids instead of being off wherever that might be, somewhere in the past, somewhere in the future, worry or feeling bad about something. Just, I think to me, happiness is just being present. And stoicism helps with that because it frees up real estate that you don't have to worry or think or ruminate about this other stuff. After you practice for a while, you kind of just can quickly can kind of see what you need to spend your time with and what you don't need to spend your time with. And then complement that with mindfulness which is just very much about being in the present moment. And even when you do feel those negative emotions, mindfulness helps bring objectivity to it. You know, okay, I'm feeling anxious right now. So what does that mean? How does my body feel right now? What, does, what is this anxiety telling me? Um, you know, instead of, again, just, you know, feeling anxious about feeling anxious or feeling sad about being sad or feeling angry about being angry, just kind of accepting that a little bit more. So I'll, again, long rambling answer to a short question. I'll say, I think happiness is just presence, just being here in the now, in the present moment where kind of all the good stuff is happening anyhow. I, I would be inclined to, to agree. I think that's the one piece of stoicism I struggle with the most though, not necessarily not being present, but um, if you're truly present, you're not recognizing that you're being present. And so every once in a while, I'm like, wait a minute, have I been too present? And then I'm like, I'm not worried at all about the future. I need to be paying attention at least a little bit, right? So no matter what, it's a dance. It's just, it's good to have somebody else kind of uh, give me that perspective, especially because we, I, I feel like we've both gone through the same Naval uh, tunnel. Um, but, I, you know, and to that end, I think that, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if your first book is a compilation in the same way the uh, Naval Almanac, Naval Almanac, 
is he write because Naval didn't really write that. It's just a collection of everything he had previously said or written. Um, and you're building that content library now. Um, yeah, and there yeah, are. No, oh, sorry, you're ahead. Ahead. I was just going to ramble. You, you ramble. You're trying to ramble. <laughs> I touched on Naval a couple of points here. Yeah, Naval Ravikant, the book you're referencing is The Almanac of Naval Ravikant by Eric Jorgensen. Um, great book. You know, who's Naval? You know, some people listen like, who the heck's Naval? And, you know, so, you know, I kind of discovered Naval on a Tim Ferriss podcast maybe a couple of few years ago. He's a cool guest. I was like, yeah, all right, cool. He had some cool stuff to say. He's, uh, you know, like an angel investor, was an early founder in a lot of, you know, I don't know. Yeah, he founded Angel List, which is which yeah, is where I, I I initially heard about him. Yeah, yeah, Angel List, but he's also kind of morphed into this modern day philosopher. Um, and it just says a lot of really cool, interesting things um, to kind of change your mindset. And whether you agree with him one hundred percent or not on some things he says, he's always very thought provoking and you know kind of crystallizes thoughts really well in what he says. So uh, yeah, kind of another Twitter thing. Like I end up listening to some more podcasts with him on. He's a great follow on Twitter. Um, but yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's pretty cool. And I've, I've enjoyed that. And yeah, that book, The, no the Almanac of Naval Ravikant is a good one. Yeah, or as some people like try to say, the Naval Manac. Naval Manac, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not the easiest thing for, for two dumb white guys to say. So. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, uh, we are we are on that time. But yeah, again, I always think any every conversation we have, whether I'm recording a podcast or, or otherwise, you know, you're a great friend uh, and definitely one of the best things that has come out of my professional career thus far. Oh, well, that means a lot, Michael. Right back at you. Uh, definitely enjoy our friendship as well. Have uh, really loved our conversations, whether the record button is being pressed or not. Always enjoy talking to you. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a great one. All right. Take care.